Do this, not that, lighting edition. Are you looking to improve your lighting, but you're not really sure how or if you're even doing it wrong? Well, I'm gonna give you a rundown of what to do and what not to do so you can start improving your lighting today. Hello, my name is Mike Lloyd. I am a professional photographer in Silicon Valley, California, and I freaking love lighting. I gotta say, this video was one of the most difficult ones I've ever made because when I did the shoot to show you all of these samples of the right and wrong ways to do this lighting, it was really hard for my soul to take bad photos on purpose. So uh, I hope you appreciate the sacrifice I made for you in taking these because it's just innate for me. I've been doing this for so long. I've been teaching it for so long. I can just walk into a room, set up everything, dial in the settings, and I know what it's gonna look like before I even take a photo. So I got everything set up and then I purposefully made these mistakes so I can show you how to identify what's right and what you should not do in lighting. I'm gonna go through about a half dozen dif different examples for you so you get to learn lots of different things to look out for. Let's dive in. Alrighty, so in this first example, uh, this is poor placement of the key light. The key light is the main light source in an image. Whatever the modifier is, whether it's the sun or a window or a flash or whatever, the main light source in an image is called either the main light or the key light. And there's a handful of right ways to position it and there are a ton of wrong ways to position it. This is a wrong way because it is straight on from the subject. Now there's a time and a place for that. Portraits, usually not one of them. And you can tell because the, the shadows of her nose are not down, they are directly behind. We lose the top of her head on the dark background and kind of weird shadows coming off the neck there. The light is just too low. So I raised it up a little bit and the next one, you can see the top of her head better. There's a little better spill in the background, uh, much better you know, carving out of the cheekbones and the jawline. And if you're noticing all these highlights over here, that's a little sneak peek of what we've got coming next. So let me just jump back to the first one. The lighting is straight onto her face. And this one, I raised it up a little. It gives us the highlights on the forehead, the tops of the cheekbones, the ridge line of the nose, shadows underneath the chin, elongate the neck and create that separation. That is the best practice for positioning your main light when it comes to portraits generally. Again, these are not hard, fast rules. There is very, very few things that we can universally say you should always do or never do. And off the top of my head, I can't think of, of any of them because there's always a time and a place to be creative with something but it's like jazz musicians from the 1950s and 40s. They had to learn what the rules were to learn how to break them. And, and we do the same thing. So in this one, uh, the second thing to look out for is the rim lights. Are they blown out? If we zoom in on this photo, you can see how bright this line is around her body. This is a rim light. This is to create separation between her and the background. But also, look at the shadows from her earrings and her ears are glowing orange and the hair also totally blown out. Um, same thing here down by her arm, you can see how much light there is. That rim light, totally blown out. So if we jump back to the first image, we still got shadows from the earrings. That's just the earrings that she's wearing. I'm not bummed about that quite so much. I might turn her cheek a little bit more so we don't have this, but this image is about the lighting. I, I didn't spend the time to dial in the pose. Her ear is not glowing bright orange like it is in this one because we don't have too much light going through it. There's still detail in the hair and you can see detail on her skin all the way down. This is a properly exposed rim light. This is totally blown out. So yes, we want the rim light to be brighter than the rest of our subject, but we don't want it to be blown out and totally losing detail. All right, and if you're like, okay, this is cool, but like, what lights do I use? How do I actually place them? What modifiers are these? What setup is this? All of that is in the Boudoir Guild in the lighting course. I've also got two other videos on this channel. One light four different ways and two lights 
four different ways where I demo some of these lighting setups for you and show you lighting diagrams so that you can recreate them. But if you wanna know how far apart to put the light modifiers, how high up should they be, and, and more ways to know if you're doing them right or wrong, it's all in the lighting course in the Boudoir Guild. All right, let's go to the next point. Lens flare. Lens flare occurs when light travels directly into the lens and hits the image sensor. And you get this washed out foggy look. Again, sometimes it could be really cool for creative effects, but it washes out the image. You lose a ton of contrast. Um, I'm also like cringing looking at my background over here, being all like wrinkled up at the bottom. Totally fine. Again, this was a really difficult shoot for me emotionally because of how many mistakes I had to make on purpose. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's cool to show these kind of lights in the background, whether we're doing photos of a musician or pro athlete, you know, or student athletes, pro athletes, whatever, because it, it simulates like stadium lights, really cool things that we can do with those without washing those out. So then here's an example of getting that same sort of effect. And again, this isn't technically perfect. I would want to blow out or totally lose the background into black. I would pose her a little bit differently. But the point is I'm using the lights in a way to get the rim lights on her plus to see the visible flash in the background without totally washing out the scene. Maybe you like the, the lens flare and the sort of washed out look. You can go sort of in between the two. And what is the difference? These, the strobes are firing directly at the camera. And in this photo, I turned them inward so the light isn't directly hitting the lens. So play around with it. Find out what, what you like, what works best for your style. Again, it's all art. It's a personal preference. Generally, we don't want washed out images. Now, this could happen with any light source. So if you're outdoors, the sun will do this too. And if you position your frame right about here, and I'm looking at this light over here on the right side. So just the bottom of the sun, and again, we're pretending we're outside and this light is the sun. This will create that cool lens flare effect where you get like the rings and circles look like bubbles streaking out across the frame. That's a fun thing to play with uh, when you are shooting outdoors and you wanna get that lens flare effect. But now you know what it is. It's light traveling directly into the barrel of the lens instead of coming in at an angle where it's it's reflected. All right, let's do the next one. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Not a terrible photo, right? I mean, I don't like the hard line that goes right into the middle of her head at her hair part. Obviously, I'd wanna remove the things from the background, but overall, not a terrible portrait. However, if we zoom in over here, you can see purple cast along her skin. She has great complexion in reducing that. If you have a more fair-skinned person against a colorful wall, you are gonna get more of that color showing up in their skin tone. This happens when you put them too close to a colored wall. It could be literally anything that reflects light back. That's why it's really important in wherever you are shooting to make sure wherever the light is coming from, it's the color that you want it. If you're outdoors and you're up against a building that might have a tan color or red brick or anything else, the light will bounce off of that and leave a color cast on the skin. And I can't just go into this image and reduce you know, the purple saturation because then I lose the wall. I would have to mask that off of her and then reduce the tones there. It just creates a lot more work. It'd be way easier if I just positioned her against the gray wall to not get that sort of effect or move her a little bit farther away from the wall so I don't get as much light hitting the wall and bouncing back onto her face. Now, this is a more mild case because of her complexion and my wall has a matte finish. I got the most matte paint that I could get to reduce any of that. If the surface is any shinier and it bounces more light back, you would get way more purple on the skin. So I have engineered my studio to make it difficult to get the color casts, but this is something you absolutely want to look out for. All right, now the next one. How far away should the lights be from your subject? Again, there is no right or wrong 
necessarily, but there are better ways to achieve different looks. And that is really what you have to know. The larger a light source is in relation to the subject, the softer it will be. And the farther away it is, the harder the light source will be. So quality of light is what I'm talking about right now. It's not good or bad, it's the transition from shadows to highlights. So in this image, zoom in a little bit, you can see where we go from highlights on the skin to shadows. It's a pretty gradual transition. There's a nice gradient there from the shadows to the highlights. Same thing, her shadow on the wall. It's not like a, you know, her shaped shadow. There is a pretty gradual transition from the darkest point to the lightest point. Now we go one forward and there is a human shaped shadow. It's kind of creepy right behind her. And if we look at her skin, you can see again, harder shadows here on the face. We get more bright hot spots on her as well. And that's because we're increasing the contrast essentially compared to where we are here. The only difference between these two is the distance of the light from my subject. Uh, and then I moved it back. So here it's closer, here it's farther away. There's a lot more to explain as far as quality of light and spill and directionality, all of that. That's not the point of this video, but it's something to consider. The closer you move your light to your subject, the softer the light will be, meaning you're not gonna have these hard shadows on the wall or on their face. Instead, you're gonna have a more gradual transition. If you're also thinking, well, the light must have changed direction or something because it's way darker over here now, and this is properly exposed, where over here, the whole scene is brighter, and that is because of spill. So just using this for example, uh, that's not what I had in this scene, but if I was just lighting with this honeycomb grid, it comes out of here, what is this? This is a, a 20 degree grid. I have a 20 degree circle. So what is this, uh, five inches from the edge of the reflector, my light is only gonna make a spot on the wall as big as where my hands are right now. However, those lines continue to spread out forever. So as we get to be 10, 12 feet away, it's no longer this. Now I have a spot on the wall that's maybe this wide. So that's why we're getting the coverage of the entire scene because we don't have a more focused beam of light. We have it spread out. And the only difference is the distance to the subject. You could get a bigger light source if you wanted to do that or narrow things down with a grid to control all of that. But spill is the thing that we're looking out for here and it's the directionality of the light. So if you're not digging the way your photos are looking because you have these weird shadows like that, move the lights closer. And if you can't move the lights closer, get a larger light source. So I know I just threw a lot at you in a very short amount of time and there are a million things that I could pick apart in these images other examples that I could give you. Again, I go over all of that in the lighting courses in the Boudoir Guild. So if you head to boudoirguild.com, check out the lighting course. I have, there's probably like 20, 25 videos, maybe 30. There's a lot of content in there all about lighting, whether it's one light setups, two light setups, natural light, using strobes, what all the different modifiers are, how to know when it's right, how to fix it. All of that is in there, so. You can, you can start doing these things as innately as I do without even thinking about it. So you can walk into any scene and just like the way you want to with confidence every single time. So if you have any questions about this, drop them in the comments below. And if you want to share some of your own images for the photo critiques that I do in our Facebook group, you can do that as well. We'll have a link to the Facebook group down below. You can join and submit your images the next time we do a round of critiques and I can also help you with the lighting over there. But those lighting courses, definitely the way to go. You are amazing. See you inside.